Good morning um, and welcome along to the webinar uh, covering safety audits on site. Um, my name is Robert Butler, I'm the head of CIF training and um, I'm here this morning just to give you a short 15-20 minute presentation um, on site audits. Okay, so basically what we're going to cover in this webinar is to how to conduct a safety audit and get the maximum benefits from the process. What we're going to look at is what is a hazard and again looking at that, covering the, the broad safety area, the psychosocial, MSD, biological agents, chemical agents, and physical agents. So this is a very broad 360 view of what uh, we will be looking at as an audit team on site. Obviously what we need to do is look at what the law says. From the point of view of the, the audit, there's nothing in legislation that specifies the legal duty, but it is part of the risk assessment process. And under section 19.1, um, under section 19.1, it requires you to carry out a risk assessment in writing. Now, part of your, your risk assessment process is ongoing and continuous improvement. So from that point of view, the audit process is critical in developing, you know, your lessons learned from, you know, outcomes on site as you're going along. We also then have a duty of care, and this is why we do the audits. Um, and that is basically the employer's duty of care, making sure that basically we have safe systems or safe sites, safe access, safe plant and equipment. You can decide on the when and the where, the frequency. I personally would recommend weekly audits, um, possibly interchanging with your safety team on various sites if you have multiple sites. But again, critically, I would always try and do the audits very early in the morning, first thing before the day starts off, so that you get the benefit immediately from your findings on site and you can put in corrective actions very quickly. The systems themselves, again, everybody is different. Um, you have now got IT based audit systems, you can design those and have them on mobile uh, systems such as apps on phones or on iPads. But again, quite a lot of people still go around with the audit sheets and complete those and have a, a visible record on the day. Really, one of the critical things after you, you do have an incident on site is to have the audit, which looks at the whole area of the incident. It's part maybe of the investigation process but it would look at future prevention. Obviously, we don't want a reoccurrence of an incident, so that's another reason we do them. And then, I suppose, at the end of the audit process, it's what actions are taken and by who. What, if we don't actually have a wrap-up meeting, we don't have an action-led outcome, we're not gonna get the benefits of the audit. Pre-audit inspection, an inspection is not just a physical inspection of the workplace, it's looking at the, your whole process, your management system, your safety file on site, uh, your accident books. And one of the things I always say to people, if your accident book is blank, you potentially have a problem because you're not catching the minor incidents, such as your first aid accidents. So again, critically, if you have an incident, no matter how minor, it should be recorded uh, because it does allow your safety team access to that information over a prolonged period of time. And maybe they might be able to come up with a solution for the likes of the first aid accidents, which is that your hand injuries. Um, looking at dangerous occurrences and accident reporting, again, historically that is one way of looking to see what is actually going on within the business, what incidents or dangerous occurrences or nearnesses you're having and how you can then react to those within your risk assessment process. Examining sickness absentee records also gives you an insight as to what is going on within the business from the point of view of ill health and potentially things like musculoskeletal disorders, the MSDs, they can be highlighted in these absentee reports. Um, looking at the risk assessment process that you have in place then, what was the last review date? Um, you know, it's advised that at least once a year risk assessments are reviewed to see are there changes required, do the control measures need to be moved, um, or have we actually missed something in the risk assessment process? If you've got chemical agents on site, it's always good to know what's in the safety data sheets, what are the first aid requirements on site if an incident happens with a spill, um, and there are a number of 16 bullet points within those data sheets that give you critical information around the particular products that you're using, including basically how and what you should be doing regarding the, the prevention from a PP side of the house. So the safety data sheets are critical from the point of view of anybody that has chemical agents on site. You should have a data sheet for every chemical agent. And obviously this is used then as part of your risk assessment process. It's also used for providing adequate PPE to the staff on site, and obviously then for first aid actions as well. And then finally then looking at your training records, how up-to-date are these? Um, people requiring upskilling, retraining, 
renewal of courses, particularly in the areas of the compliance, such as manual handling, the first aid, brace of wheels. So again, monitoring those records um, to make sure that people's records are up to date, including obviously as well, safe paths and CSCS, they're not to be forgotten. Undertaking the audit, well, preparing a checklist, you know, relevant to the task and relevant to the site, um, that is something that your, your safety team should be able to do and basically have a tailored and specific to what's going on. Obviously, to have a generic box at the end where additional information can be put in place around hazards that are found that are outside of the, the normal work practice. Uh, it could be related to subcontractors on site. Um, looking at the high risk tasks and um, those that basically generate the, you know, possibly the worst outcomes in the industry, such as working at heights, plant and machinery and pedestrian construction workers, um, those need to be tasked um, very, very much high on the, the checklist um, when you're doing your audit and corrective action should be instantaneous if you find a problem with these, because these are critical from the point of view, they shouldn't be left at the end of an audit process. Um, in some cases, it may be a stop work and put a corrective action in place. Um, the critical aspect, I suppose, of, of the audit is that it's not a tick box exercise. You should engage with the people on site, your own staff, uh, your subcontractor teams, and get their views as to what's happening or the reasons as to why they're doing things. Another critical thing to have is your phone with you from the point of view of taking photos of what you're finding and the corrective actions put in place so you can show you know, the bad practice against the change in behavior or the correction taken on a particular system of work. Um, another area, I suppose, that is critical, but everybody's different, is making notes so that you can have a discussion at the end of the meeting. Again, this should involve the senior team on site. It may even involve the senior team back at, at the office, just to let them know what's actually happening and what you're finding. And if you don't know the answer to something, because um, it, it is one of those areas where it's a very broad audit, you may need to go and seek advice from a third party or from someone else on site. And uh, never be afraid to get advice or ask uh, for help or assistance. The purpose of work inspections, it, it's, I suppose it's to look at, at a couple of different things in relation to staff on site, it's to listen to their concerns and their problems. Um, and you know, sometimes you, you, you'll pick up some really critical information from those guys in relation to hazards that, that you may be unaware of. Recognize then that there are conditions and behaviors in place uh, that need to be, you know, driven from the top of the business down that you, you will want to see kind of behavior and practices and processes that are suitable to the work environment and that are reducing the risk of injury or loss. Um, obviously then your risk assessment, your hazard identification, are they working? Um, or have you missed things that you haven't picked up because of new practices or other activities on site? And then making recommendations then on the implementation of controls to eliminate and reduce the risk to an acceptable level. So it's, it's basically risk assessment, but it's a critical part of the audit as you're going around. Don't interrupt workers that are performing critical tasks as it's a distraction and may lead to an incident. Um, you can always come back and engage with them after they finish the role they're doing. Uh, don't touch uh, potentially hazard equipment, objects or work surfaces. If you're unaware of what's going on, ask for advice before you engage. Um, an audit is not just a quick once over and leave. It's, it's a process that requires time and requires detailed attention uh, to what you're actually doing. Uh, never leave a serious hazard unaddressed. Obviously, if you find a serious hazard on site, it's a stop work. It's a corrective action with an immediate action. Um, and again, if the mobile phone is a distraction or you're being distracted by something else, put it away until the audit process is over so that you can actually get the, the maximum benefit from what you're doing. The workplace inspection report, okay, you're, you're identifying the local hazards, you're trying to get the detail um, of the hazard itself so that you can describe it and how you're going to deal with it. Indicate if it's a repeat item, if you've done previous audits and this keeps on appearing, it's obviously not been corrected on site, it may require the further action. Um, you may need to prioritise some of the hazards that you find and put corrective actions in place. So again, always be able to kind of action those on site while you're there with the senior team. You may be able to prevent accidents and incidents by looking at possible causes, um, recommending the corrective actions and indicating the responsible person on site, but close it out by following up with that person in due course to make sure that it has been actioned. So give them a timeline. If it's something you want done in an hour, if it's something you want done within the day, but certainly make sure that you follow with that individual to close it out.
when you're doing your audits and you've completed your, your walk around, obviously any serious problems need to be notified immediately uh, so that you can get the corrective action in place. Other items on site that you know are of a lower risk level need to be prioritized for action. So that can be done uh, in discussion with the team on site. Try to agree a timetable with the site management for the completion of those type issues and then check that the measures are implemented properly and in time. Um, obviously, when you come back to do your next audit, you don't want to see those issues turning up again. And if there's any action that's required or issue is serious that needs to be followed up on, do so. The snapshot, I suppose, the goal of the audit is to look at continuous improvement in your OHS systems. Uh, identifying risks and hazards is common sense. Uh, it's not just for the safety team to be doing, it's for all people on site that work there. Looking at the identification of weaknesses and strengths on site, and obviously whether you have the right procedures in place with a legal compliance in mind. Can I defend this action that I'm taking in litigation or in court at a later stage? The audit should uh, look at the current documentation practices and are they meeting best practice and legal obligations? Um, if you're recommending improvements in your safety procedures or risk assessment, it should be done in detail and may have to be taken off-site to be dealt with. Ensure there are adequate resources available to the management of the OHS, so that your, your site safety, safety supervisors, your, your safety reps, your site managers, your health and safety officers. Ensure that there is a resource devoted to health and safety and that they are being utilized effectively. Again, one of the big challenges here is that, you know, if you have multiple sites, are you getting around are you aware of the, what's going on on site? Uh, sometimes you need to prioritize your visits within a given week or month because of certain works that are taking place which are high risk. And you know, ensure that the resources are devoted to health and safety are being utilized effectively. Um, if you look at the work program, you may decide that there are certain activities going on on site that you want to be present for uh, because maybe they're high risk or because maybe they're a one-off and you want to make sure that those pass off as per the methodology and with the risk assessments in place. So prioritize your high level of high risk activities. The management of the audit process, um, obviously this is a record that will be retained for the life of the project. It goes into the safety file. So basically as part of your health and safety management system, you need to identify um, what is the system you're going to use I mean, can we focus particularly on activity? Are we going to be looking at, uh, at the operation, the scaffold, the temporary work side of the house, or is it an overall performance on the health and safety management system, especially if you're dealing with an ISO or a safety cert system? So in addition to the audits, this information will be constantly coming back to the safety team on site. Um, critical elements, I suppose, regarding the management system, um, we're looking at the overall health and safety planning the structure that's involved, um, who's responsible, and who's actually the, the planning structures that you have. Looking at the overall responsibilities and the structure on the occupational health and safety side, um, making sure that that's efficiently laid out and that you're getting the maximum benefit of the team that you have. If you have meetings that need to happen, that the consultation at those meetings is minuted, that you have uh, an allocated time to discuss safety on site at all meetings so that basically everybody on site is aware of what's going on. Implementation of procedures and practices. Um, again, if you're trying to drive change in behavior, that needs to be supported from the top down on site. Um, the ongoing monitoring of hazard identification, risk assessment and controls is a daily battle. Um, you will find that tasks change, methodologies change, and they may impact on the hazard and risk assessment that's present. Um, obviously then looking at the, the training of your own staff and of your subcontractors. Do you have a minimum standard for entering site? Um, and what is that? And is everybody meeting that standard? Obviously then using your toolbox talks, your site inductions, risk assessment briefings, um, whiteboard meetings to drive particular agenda items that you're finding from the audits is critical. So the audit process isn't just for the safety team and the senior management team, it's getting the information back to everybody in site that's impacted by the type of activity that's going on. And then, you know, if you're putting a measurement in or you have KPIs, you know, establishing where your performance is in reliance to other companies of a similar size nature and complexity. And then obviously then as part of the overall OHS system audit, 
you're, you're going to be bringing your audit reports in to discuss what you're finding, if there's trends that you, you want to try and change for the year ahead, um, and obviously then an overview of the full risk assessment and OHS system once a year. I suppose, just to, for those of you that may not have conducted audits before, um, and again, from the point of view, it's a learning curve for, for a lot of people, you base the audit on the questions around the law and the standards uh, as per the type of task you're doing. The first audit you document, you're looking at the safety procedures and are they compliant. Second audit is the level of compliance of these safety procedures in an actual workplace by doing the inspection on the tasks that have been carried out by the staff. Obviously, as part of conducting an audit, you're going to write a report. You're going to either have a template or you're going to be generating a report in a format, in a Word document. Um, it's critical that that information is passed on to those that have a responsibility to activate change or deal with the control measures or recommendations. The report itself must list um, what issues you're alerting people to. These are called your audit findings in simple terms. And then obviously the use of the audit report is identify the risks and assess the levels of risk to those that are exposed to it and what actions you're going to take to fix it. Developing the action plan, the correction action is the critical aspect of it. If we don't if we don't basically deal with the outcomes of the other report, they're, they're pointless. So the corrective actions need you know, a designated person, a designated timeline as to when they're going to be complete. You prioritize the risk controls that you will apply to those risks in the hierarchy of controls. The action plan should be communicated to all employees with the relevant training or responsibility on site. Some of the actions that you need to take may be included in your objectives and targets, Others may be something that you have to deal with on a longer scale based on financial planning or budgets. Here you see a sample of the Be Smart construction uh, site inspection checklist for safety reps. This is a very useful document uh, for anybody starting off the first time um, or for safety reps you know, on site for them to do their initial inspections and get a feel for what um, they're looking for on site. It, it ticks a lot of boxes, but it also gives you an opportunity to add to it. And the BSmart system is a HSA approved online management system, it develops your management system for small businesses. And um, it also develops a health and safety plan, but it has supplemental documents such as these to help people continue to improve their activity on site from a safety point of view. Typical top topics that you'll come across on site audits or inspections. You know, looking at the administration requirements, and again, that's basically looking at the management system on site in the safety file. Looking at training records, your risk management, and general requirements on site as to what activities are being undertaken. What consultation, cooperation, or coordination is going on, so that'll be down to your communication at meetings. Your safe systems of work, your method statements, your methodologies as to how the work is being done, and how well those have been, you know, monitored and adhered to on site. The general working environment, um, which changes in construction from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. Then you've got the high risk activities such as confined space and do we have proper protocols in, space, in, in place around rescue. We look at the high risk activities such as confined spaces and do we have the proper protocols in place around the area of rescue in the event of something going wrong. Looking at falling objects and public protection. If you're facing onto a public roadway or pathway, you need to consider that aspect of things. Broadly falls from heights, and um, one of the highest problems we have in, I'll do that again. Falls from heights, one of the highest risks we have in the industry, um, and every year we see fatals because of it, so the management of that is critical. The use of ladders and platforms that are supported by ladders, um, they will require weekly sign off and monitoring for uh, damage or basically issues that you might find. Your scaffolding, scaffolding basically you have your weekly checks and your handovers, you're monitoring by a competent person. If there's demolition works, you're gonna have someone who's a specialist contractor in that space. So again, making sure that they're adhering to the methodology. Any welding, brazing, hot works, um, again, you're, you're gonna have your fire watch and your program of work around that activity. Essential underground works, again, monitoring that the area is managed correctly, that the risk assessments are in place, and that things are in place to protect workers, such as trench boxes. 
in the area if it requires it. Um, excavations, excavation is another higher area of risk and again requires monitoring and again the use of trench boxes or other systems in place to minimize exposure of the workers to danger. Any electrical works should be only done by a competent practitioner with method statements and um, lockout tagout systems in place, depending on the level of risk. Your site plant and equipment, again, the interaction between that and the pedestrian construction worker needs to be monitored and that you know adequate walkways are in place to segregate those people. Any type of tilt up or precast construction um, will require specialist attention and will fall under temporary works. Manual handling tasks or systems that are in place to aid that task should be implemented fully to reduce musculoskeletal disorders. Hazardous substances and dangerous goods, again, the storage, the management of those, the use of correct PPE, and obviously having the safety data sheets in place to deal with any uh, issues that you come across. Um, on older sites or sites that are requiring renovation, you're gonna come across possible asbestos management. And again, only competent people should be involved in that space. If in doubt, seek advice. And then you have the broad area of noise and vibration. You have the European standards, you have the Irish legislation, you have good guidance from the HSA, all of which need to be put in place on site. And then the big issue on site to minimize uh, injuries to pedestrian construction workers is traffic management. Uh, having a traffic management plan, having you know authorized parking areas, um, and making sure that those are maintained and mandatory. And then a high risk one, but not a very common one, is high risk hazardous atmospheres. And again, only competent qualified specialists will do that kind of work. You will find as you're going around sites that you will come across notices of signage that are appropriate or inappropriate. They need to be clear and visible. And if they're not appropriate to what's going on, they need to be removed. You have zones and activities that are actively separated from each other for good reason, based on hazard identification. Access routes and walkways must be well demarked and must be managed from a housekeeping point of view. Um, hazardous substances must be contained to make sure that basically the risk is managed and a health and safety plan is in place and active at all times. Your designated first aiders, your fire assembly points, your fire wardens are notified within canteens, within the office, so that basically people know what to do. And again, with emergency procedures, we should be practicing our fire drills. Uh, the process for reporting accidents on site, dangerous occurrences, near misses. Who do we go to on site? Who is the designated person? Again, that should be easily accessible through the site office or in the canteens. And obviously making sure then there's effective emergency strategy in place should something happen. Everything from a fall from heights for someone is basically on a lanyard and are dangling off the side of the building to your first aid injuries to, to a fire. And have we got evacuation routes? Are they in place? And have we practiced to make sure that people can evacuate? Topics that we will come across on site while you're doing these is that workers are provided with appropriate PPE, but are they wearing it? Are they wearing it at the appropriate times? Do they have easy access to it? Or is it in the van down in the car park? Are the welfare facilities on site appropriate and to a standard that was acceptable from a point of view that there is good housekeeping? Um, if there's additional training required, such as site inductions, toolbox talks, briefings, that they're done so and that they're recorded. And again, for companies that are in Siri, the Construction Industry Register of Ireland, these are areas where you can gather your CPD points. So again, always go to, if you're doing this kind of work on site, that it's recorded and passed back to the office for entry onto the register. Um, is the site boundary secure? Hoardings, harris fencing, to minimize the risk of young people getting into sites and becoming injured. Um, basically, security is paramount on that area. Um, if you're working in this time of, time of year, September through to kind of February, March, we will be working during the hours of darkness. So is there adequate lighting and is there adequate security measures in place after hours? Housekeeping is a critical issue, so management of Offcuts, debris, waste materials, and appropriate storage is critical to minimise trip slips and falls. About 32% of all reported accidents in the workplace are in the area of trip slip and fall, so it has to be managed. Um, from the point of view, are we fulfilling as employers our duties under the construction regs, and are the employees doing the same thing? That's part of the audit process. And then, obviously, is the health and safety file accurate and up to date? 
um, from the point of view that if you've got subcontractors coming on site, are they sending you in their method statements, their insurances, their risk assessments, their management systems well in advance of them coming to site? Uh, so that basically is the main contractor or acting as the PSCS that you can prove this information uh, as being viable to operate on your site. Okay, that's the end of the webinar. Um, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you can give us a ring at the CIF at any time. Um, after this slide here, we've given you 10 reasons as to why um, it's prudent to have an appropriate management system in place around auditing um, and the benefits of doing so. Thank you.